So good morning, my name is Jennifer Molina, and Jim Dempsey contacted me a couple of months ago and asked that I speak on the monthly theme of matriarchy. So apparently Jim was driving into New Orleans on I-10 and saw one of three billboards that were posted along the highway in January and February, and they looked like this. Um, they read, ordain women priests. Stop male supremacy in the Catholic Church. So after an internet search, I guess Jim found me um, because I am the local contact here in New Orleans for the women's ordination, which I believe he told us is the oldest and largest organization working for the ordination of women as priests in an inclusive and accountable Roman Catholic Church. So matriarchy. Um, I'm not sure that we would have that word in our language if the word patriarchy didn't exist in our vocabulary. And we know that patriarchy is a system where men hold the power and control and women are largely excluded from it. So certainly the Catholic Church, the institutional Catholic Church, is a poster child for patriarchy. But matriarchy, to be honest, although I didn't say this to Jim, I'm not entirely comfortable with that either. Um, it's June, it's Pride Month, and my friends and family from the LGBT community have slowly raised my own awareness to gender as a non-binary concept. Um, so matriarchy and patriarchy seem a bit stifling to me. So I brought the theme to my fellow women's ordination support, uh, supporters in New Orleans, and my good friend Bernadette Powell said to me, well, the thing is, is that we don't want patriarchy, we don't want matriarchy, we don't want hierarchy, and, and that's exactly it. The Women's Ordination Conference doesn't seek to simply replace those male bodies and faces at the altar with female bodies and faces. We want an inclusive and shared leadership of all people. So, I know that some people listening may not be Catholic, Many people might not identify as religious at all and be wondering why is this issue even important to me. And I would say that this is a worldwide social justice issue. Um, there are between 1.2 and 1.3 billion Catholics in the world. And the institutional Catholic Church wields a tremendous amount of influence, wealth, and power. And in late 2015, just six years ago, when Saudi Arabia finally granted women the right to vote in that country, it left the Vatican as the only nation in the world that still denies women the right to vote on its leadership, which is done in the papal conclave when the um, pope is selected. So with this model, the Catholic Church is sending the message to cultures, societies, families across the world that women are inferior and that they're not capable of the leadership. So it's an issue that's important for all people who are concerned about justice. But for me, it's deeply personal. I am a native New Orleanian, and like many native New Orleanians, I was born and raised Catholic. I went to Ursuline, a Catholic elementary and high school. I went to Boston College, a Catholic university. After college, I worked for the Jesuit Volunteer Corps a Catholic organization, and at one point I worked for Catholic Charities here in New Orleans. My mother taught religion all my life in, um, in Catholic schools, at Sacred Heart on Canal Street, later Seton Academy, and then later became principal of both Seton Academy and then Redeemer Seton Catholic High Schools here. So I'm pretty drenched in Catholicism. And naturally I followed the family tradition of raising my three children as Catholics. Um, I had them baptized. I sent them to Catholic elementary school. One out of the three attended a Catholic high school. And I took, I took them to Mass, Sunday Mass, every, every, every Sunday of their lives. They're young adults now. Um, but I was becoming increasingly uncomfortable with bringing them to Mass, um, although I did it. Because for Catholics today, it's almost inevitable that we will one day need to look our daughters in the eyes and answer their question, well, why can't I be a priest when I grow up? And for American Catholics, um, well, let me say this. What's even worse is that 
our sons won't even ask the question. And so they'll grow up feeling entitled to the leadership and feel like excluding women from it is just normal and justified. And even, from a Catholic perspective, God's will. So uh, for American Catholics, uh, or American parents by and large, are starting to tell our daughters that they can be what they want to be, they can do what they want to do, they can follow their dreams, they can even be vice president of our country. Um, so the church's stance is uncomfortable for us. But the Catholic Church is diminishing, it's shrinking in the United States and Europe. And the places where it's growing um, are some developing nation. And in some of those countries, the church's stance reinforces the cultural disenfranchise of women. Um, the attitude is women can't do this and women can't do that, and look, even the church says it. So I continue to take my children to mass, but I couldn't allow them to think that I agreed with or was complacent about gender discrimination. So I started searching for others who were fed up. And that's when I found the Women's Ordination Car Conference. Um, it was started over Thanksgiving weekend in 1975, when more than 1,200 women's ordination supporters gathered in Detroit uh, for its first conference. From so from women's ordination conference, or WAC, I'm just gonna say WAC, I first bought this pink t-shirt. And it says, good Catholic girls support women's ordination. And I began to dream about wearing my good Catholic girls support women's ordination t-shirt to Mass one Sunday. But I was terrified. Um, it is no coincidence that in the Catholic Church we refer to priest as father. It's a very paternalistic environment and we are taught to show deference and respect to all priests. And I knew that my fellow parishioners, although many of them agree with me, uh, would see that as a lack of respect. So I brought my frustration and my vision of wearing my shirt to Mass to um, a group of people at a place called, a uh, small community at a place called Hope House. Hope House is here in New Orleans. It was founded by some Catholic nuns in the late 60s in the St. Thomas housing development. And it is still a neighborhood uh, center in that area today. So in about 2004, I began um, going to, they have a, a gathering of people twice a month to pray and reflect. And they're mostly, there are about 20 of us, they're mostly Catholics and former Catholics. And I shared um, my thoughts with them, and, and they shared their frustration with me as well. And they gave me courage, and together we brainstormed about ways that we could take action. But in 2012, a catalyst really pushed us to act. So in 2012, a man named Father Roy Bourgeois, a Catholic priest, was excommunicated by the Vatican. And he was laicized or dismissed as a priest. Father Roy Bourgeois is originally from Lutcher, Louisiana. So he sounds a lot like Bobby Hebert on Sports Talk. He has that same accent, that same passion, except he talks about women's ordination instead of Saints football. And he had been awarded a Purple Heart in the Navy he was a Nobel Peace Prize nominee just for work that he had done before he got involved with women's ordination. Uh, he was 74 years old, old at the time of his excommunication, and he had served as a married old priest for 40 years. But in 2008, Bourgeois had committed what the Vatican deems a grave crime. Did he sexually abuse a child? No. Did he commit a legal crime? No. What Roy Bourgeois did was that he had participated in the ordination of a woman, Janice Sever Desinska. And after the ordination, he received a letter from the Vatican ordering him to recant his support for women's ordination within 30 days or face excommunication. Bourgeois replied that he could not recant his support because it was a matter of personal conscience. And church teaching tells us that personal conscience takes precedence over dogma. So four years later, Bourgeois was ousted from the order and eventually excommunicated. Excommunication is the gravest penalty in the Catholic Church, and it denies a person the sacraments, except for reconciliation, and it denies a person a Catholic 
burial. So the church considers the attempted, and that is in quotes, ordination of a woman as a, and it, this is in quotes, this is not, these are not my words, a grave crime. That warrants, it warrants excommunication automatically, both for the woman and for the person ordaining the woman. So in that regard, it warrants the same punishment and label from the Vatican as clerical sexual abuse of a child. So in 2012, Roy Bourgeois was excommunicated, and our local WAC chapter here marched out to St. Louis Cathedral for the Archdiocesan ordination of men. Um, and we have been outside of the Archdiocesan ordination every Sunday, every, every year since then, except for last year because of COVID. So we stand outside of Jackson Square holding a big purple ordained women banner, and I'm going to try to show it to you now. So we hold this banner, um, and we hold it up in Jackson Square, and we face St. Louis Cathedral, where priests from all over the city line up around the cathedral, waiting, to, waiting for the procession into the cathedral for the ordination. And so we pray for the men who are being ordained, and the women who are denied that vocation. And we pray for the day that one day they'll be able to walk alongside each other into that cathedral and be ordained together. So we sing traditional Catholic hymns that would be relevant like, all are welcome, we are called. It's a very powerful moment. As some priests struggle to avert their eyes as they process into the church, and others give us a thumbs up and this here just shows some priests talking to each other as they're in that line waiting to proceed. The last person in the procession is always the Archbishop, Archbishop Amon. And I have personally met with Archbishop Amon about women's ordination. I've given him a copy of Roy's, Roy Bourgeois' book, From Silence to Solidarity. He told me that he knows Roy Bourgeois. They went to seminary together. Um, and I also gave him a copy of the film Pink Smoke Over the Vatican that Jim mentioned before about women priests. So... Just as, <clears throat> just as powerful as, um, as the people in the procession who see us are the reactions from the many visitors in Jackson Square, from the tourists who cheer us on to the children who stop and slowly read that banner and then say, yeah, they should. So we're there to make a statement, yes to the hierarchy, and to the ordination attendees. But we're also there to be a reminder to all of the women and girls who pass us by that they too can hear a valid calling from God to be a priest. And this is what the church denies when it says that only men can receive a valid call from God to be priests. But there are some women who are not waiting for permission, and they are becoming the change that they want to see. And in the summer of 2002, seven women known as the Danube Seven were ordained as Roman Catholic women priests on the Danube River in Germany by a Catholic Argentinian bishop who, who was no longer re recognized by the Vatican. The women came from Germany, Austria, and the US. Uh, they were married, some were single. There was a teacher, a nun, several theologians, they had all undergone um, theological training that's similar to what male priests receive. Um, afterwards, they were quickly excommunicated and fired from church jobs. So that number of seven has now grown from 2002 to over 200 women priests worldwide ordained through ARCWP, which is Association of Roman Catholic Women Priests, and RCWP, which is simply Roman Catholic women priests, those two organizations. Uh, the Vatican does not consider these ordinations to be valid, valid, but the women do consider themselves as Roman Catholic priests. And in 2018, Vogue magazine published the article, What a, woman, a Roman Catholic Woman Priest Looks Like. And just this week, New Yorker published uh, The Women Who Want to Be Priests. 
So the New Orleans Walk chapter has hosted home masses celebrated by several of these women, including Janice Severodzinska, and their gifts, like Amethyst Star, are undeniable. So I want to tell you what happened after Katrina to my home parish. I went to Sacred Heart of Jesus on Canal Street. It was closed. And the Holy Cross Provincial, because it's not located here, the provincial came down to New Orleans to meet with us, the parishioners of Sacred Heart, um, in the Archway of St. Anthony of Padua, which is where our church was being merged. And the group was almost entirely composed of women, many of them elderly, uh, really upset uh, that they were losing this parish. Uh, many of them have been, gone to church there all their lives. Um, and everyone was, you know, lamenting the shortage of priests and the effect on church closures. And, and one, one older woman said, you know, we need to encourage our boys to be priests. We don't even mention it anymore as, a, as an option. You know, we're selfish. We want grandchildren. Because you may know that men are not just expected to be male. They're also supposed to be celibate. So she, she says this, and at the time I wasn't really involved with women's ordination. I didn't really think up much of it. And since then, I've thought back on her comment a lot. And about how easily we as women, the majority of people in the pews, the backbone of the church, will blame ourselves for this so-called priest shortage. And the fact of the matter is, we do not have a priest shortage in the Catholic Church. Because as always, God provides, and God has provided us with an abundance of priests. The problem is our own, our own blindness, the blindness of our church that refuses to recognize the gifts among half the population. So last year, when COVID hit, uh, it forced Roy Bourgeois, who's now 83 years old, to cancel all his speaking engagements about women's ordination, and he was restless. And he hatched up this idea to erect ordained women billboards. And the New Orleans Walk community, as Jim said, raised $4,900 to erect three billboards along I-10 in January and February of this year. So since then, the billboards have popped up in Lafayette, South Bend, Indiana, right outside of Notre Dame, uh, Syracuse, Buffalo, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, and there is now on Facebook a, national, a page called National Billboard Campaign uh, for Women's Ordination. And I continue to receive letters and emails from religion teachers in the New Orleans Catholic schools who struggle with teaching their students that our church still will not allow women to be priests and who want to join us in front of the cathedral but can't because of the real fear of losing their jobs. But I continue to find hope in places like Hope House because it is in such places that my creative spirit is nourished. Uh, the community there helped me to dream of possibilities. And I'm going to just show this one photo of four of us there from the Hope House community wearing our pink t-shirts. Uh, they gave me the courage to do this, and they come out with me every year, rain or shine, to St. Louis Cathedral. And it did rain this year. So Hope House embodies what I read and what Jim just read from the uh, Creative Mornings manif Manifesto. These are the parts that I, really s that I really found in Hope House that nurtured my creative spirit and gave me the courage to do this. It really spoke to me when I read that um, Creative Mornings says that we believe in the power of community. Giving a damn, face-to-face -face connections, in learning from others, hugs and high fives. We bring together people who are driven by passion and purpose confident that they will inspire one another and inspire change in our neighborhoods and cities around the world. Everyone is welcome. 